Today, I am so excited to be talking with Dolly Alderton about her new novel, Good Material. There are two very important books that she has written that have impacted my life greatly. That's Ghosts and Everything I Know About Love. She has been a journalist, a columnist, a podcaster, really anything you can think of with the written word Dolly has done. And so I am so excited to have her with us today. Hello, thank you for having me. So I always think that I can give a really great description of a book, but I think it's so much better when the author themselves gives their sort of elevator pitch for us. And we're going to say spoiler free because there's some really incredible reveals and fun things that are in here. But I just wonder if you could set up the book for us. Yeah, of course. Good Material is the name of my um, second novel. It's a kind of study of a, of a broken relationship mostly told from the perspective of the dumpy, um, who is 35-year-old uh, comedian Andy Dawson, who feels like the love of his life has just uh, exited the relationship with zero explanation. And then the last kind of 20% of the book is told from the perspective of Jen, his girlfriend, who ended the relationship. And there are kind of mysteries that he tries to solve uh, in the in his portion of the book that the the reader kind of goes on that journey with him and then a lot of those mysteries are resolved and paid off when you hear Jen's side of the relationship. I love that aspect of being with Andy for so much of the story and you sort of get one sense of things that happen but you also know like as any story goes when there's two people involved you're like hmm some of these things just can't quite be right but Andy's voice is so great I think so often we think of this kind of book being told from a woman's perspective. So often this kind of story is told from women's perspectives, but this was so easy to just jump in with him. And even though it's like a voice that I don't always seek out when I'm reading, I was so glad. I was so glad to be in it and to have sort of that narrative piece go through. I'm so pleased because, you know, the female perspective is something I spend my whole life in the female perspective, basically. My friendship groups are the female perspective. The women I work with, it's the female perspective. All my readers, the female perspective. I only read women's books really now. I kind of only listen to Joni Mitchell on repeat. You know, I've spent my life, like the last kind of particularly like eight years, I suppose, like really consciously in in very female spaces and in a very female mindset. And, you know, Women, women are my thing. Women, <laughs> women are my people. All my audience and readers are women. And I feel like it would have been so natural for me to just write a story about female heartbreak. And I can I can so see what that book would have been. I really wanted to challenge myself as a novelist and also as a human and exercise empathy and imagination and uh kind of understand boys a little better which who have always been a group of people that I've been kind of endlessly fascinated and confused by and as part of my research for the book I interviewed 15 men and asked them lots of impersonal questions about heartbreak and breakups and male friendship and sex and um the thing I actually found out which I can't believe I didn't know already but it uh, it really crystallized for me in my research is heartbreak is not a female experience <laughs> devastation and rejection and madness that comes in the wake of unrequited love I think we we hear a feminine version of like telling of that story a lot but but men go just as nuts as we do it's just as painful for them they just on the whole culturally don't have the same spaces to process those emotions in the same way that women have been socialized to I think I mean, so often my female friends and I will sit around and be like, what do straight men do when they just hang out with each other? Like, what, th there's mm. such a, a narrow view on even what, like, male friendship is and how they lean on each other for support or how they navigate those difficult things. Because like you said, there is this idea that if a relationship ends or if there's even a fight that, you know, the woman is emotional and distraught and dealing with these things. But we know how women, you know, culturally reach out and get support from their friends. But 
that aspect of male friendship in this novel, I think, is really important to sort of lean on in the sense of, okay, no, like this is something that happens regardless of gender. There's these support groups. And it looks different, but it's still yeah. there. It is still there because, you know, when I was doing those interviews, I was so ready for the men that I spoke to to confound all my expectations. I was so ready for them to say, do you know what, actually, when I have a broken heart, my friends and I we sit and talk about it for months on end and I feel very comfortable crying and I feel I don't feel like I have to make it funny for them or I wanted to hear that because I didn't want to be gender essentialist I didn't want to be retrograde about it I didn't I didn't want to to have these like archetypes of how men and women behave I don't think that that's like particularly helpful in conversations about gender but I had to I had to write what I found and you know I couldn't write something as an experiment an intellectual experiment for me I had to write about real humans and the real human story that I got from all these men regardless of their age or personality or interests or class or background is that all of them had strong support networks of male friends but they definitely didn't feel that those networks were a place where they could really talk about the humiliation and the frustration and the despondency and sadness of unrequited love and being being dumped, I suppose, for want of a better word. But equally, what I try to get across in the book is that was every single man said that to me in the research and every single one of them said how much they loved their friends. So I wasn't trying to write Andy and his friendship group. There, you know, there is within that group a deficiency, I suppose, that in terms of emotional support for each other, or even emotional language, I think, that we see with Jen and her friends that they're like totally fluent in, that doesn't mean that they don't um, love each other uh, in their own way and show up for each other in the only way that is possible for that group of men to, in the, to do in the culture that we're in and the way that they've been brought up. And something that is apparent across your work, I know it comes up a lot in everything I know about love, is this importance of friendship as love and the role that that plays in all of our lives. And I was saying before we started recording that I read Good Material and Everything I Know About Love, again, very close back to back, and they play so well with each other. I recommend everyone to do it because you're going to get a lot of insights. I had a lot of like aha moments, even though I feel in some ways I've passed by some of the ages in everything I know about love, but it still hits just the same. And that sort of balance between romantic love and these sort of platonic, steadfast relationships mm -hmm. in our lives, like Andy and his best friend who have been close for their entire lives, it sort of puts things in a little different perspective. Yeah, it's so interesting that you should draw that comparison because you know, the, the book hasn't come out in America yet. So who knows? Everyone in America may hate it and may tank. <laughs> but I've had a really positive response to it in England. Really positive. I would say maybe the most positive response I've had to my work since everything I know about love. And it's not even about the positive, the like nature of the positivity. It's more like the reaction that I'm getting from readers is that it's it's that same very emotional reaction that everything I know about love seemed to give people. And, you know, I don't think it's healthy or becoming to dwell too much on the reaction to one's work and analyse it. But there is something interesting there that I think I've noticed, which is people really want to feel something when they read something. I know that's what my readers come to my work for, whether that is hopefulness or gratitude for their friendships, or a sense of peace about the mistakes and forgiveness about the mistakes that we make, or um, faith in love and romance. And I think a lot of the work that I've done in between, and I don't regret this because I think it was the work that I needed to do then. Like when I think about the first novel that I wrote, Ghost, it was much more a book about trying to make people think, I suppose. I think I was like uh, presenting a lot of ideas that I was having about gender and about biology and dating and the double standards of kind of gender double standards of dating and about aging. And, and I hope that it made uh, readers think, and I, and I also hope it made 
readers feel, but there's, I suppose there's less ideas in good material and there's more feeling. I suppose that those reading experiences of everything I know about love and good material, I am seeing that there is, a, even though there's such different stories, I think that the feelings, without spoiling the ending of good material, a lot of what I was working with uh, with the sort of not message of good material but the kind of final note is about what it is to live a life that isn't that is unconventional I suppose and what it is to be comfortable in yourself which I suppose is kind of everything the last pages of everything I know about love is about actually I think the voice feels similar to I think good material in a certain way compared to ghosts, I think maybe in this idea of thinking and feeling, there's a, a looseness, I guess, in good material. There's mm. a there's just this real sense of connection, I think, in mm. the writing, in the voice that brought my reading brain back to everything I know about love. This like confident yeah. way that you're putting all this forward is really something that I think readers will connect with. Thank you. In the idea that we're looking to feel. As I was reading this, I was thinking there's a distinct lack recently of like good breakup novels of this idea of heartbreak represented. I think people are looking for that kind of thing. We have so many stories of love and romance and the starts of relationships, but sometimes relationships end. And sometimes those things that, you know, I think about sometimes these like big romance novels and you wonder like, they can't all be together forever. Even all these great rom-coms, they don't all work out. So sometimes there has to be a book about what happens when it ends. Yeah, and I just, you know, I've wanted to write about what happens when it ends forever. Like, uh, since my first heartbreak, I've kind of wanted to write about the loss of a big love, like of a, of a big relationship and a world merged. I think different types of people process breakups differently and I'm slightly embarrassed to say that I have always found it unbearable (laughs) I've always found it a totally unacceptable part of being a human I can't accept it I can't accept that we have to do this that we fall in love with someone and we get to know their mind and their body and their family members and their childhood and their pain and their pleasure and work out all the things that annoy us about them and we find a way to live with that and then we work out all the things we love the most and we find a way to cherish those things and and then we hand ourselves over with trust to be seen and understood in the same way and then we nurture each other and sometimes we live together and you merge worlds and books and yeah friends and homes and pets and and then and then it stops and then it ends and then I just don't understand like all the practical stuff like what do you do with the letters what do you do with the gifts what do you do with the home and the animals <laughs> and it's like what do you do with the memories and all the things that that they have given to you and all the ways in which they've loved you you have to find a way of incorporating that into the woman that you then move on to be in the next person fall in love and you have to keep doing it you have to keep finding the hope to try and do it again all over again with someone else I just I don't really know how we all do that and have time to do anything else like we have to do that and also have jobs (laughs) it's just I find it I'm just a super sensitive intense person I think and I just I just have the most extraordinary awe for humans that we just we can just keep doing this over and over again And sometimes you have to have a fight with your ex in the bank when you're trying to separate your (laughs) account. It's it's a lot. There's a lot of things that go through, you know, that I think don't get talked about very much. Again, we have so much like cultural knowledge of what it's like to fall in love and Mm -hmm. all those things about how we start these relationships. And yet no one talks about you know, I mean, maybe you talk with your closest friends about, yeah, okay, I'm struggling with this and I need, you know, we have to do all these things. We have to split apart stuff and all that. But no one talks about, I think in like a lot of literature, we, we see a lot of like the dramatic pieces, but it's often the mundane little things totally. that 
are the most difficult? Well, it's just grief, I think, isn't it? I think that we're still not talking about heartbreak really in in the language of grief. And, you know, something the other day that I was thinking about is like, you know, that awful thing that happens when someone that you love dies and then there's the first moment you see their name on your phone? Like, well, when you see your WhatsApp history with them or and you're staring like they're never going to be online again. They're never going to reply to my text again. And there's something that is about that, which is so mundane and so nothingy. But there's something about what that represents existentially about how you lived your lives together and how you don't now. That is, I find, almost more difficult than it, the days after a funeral. You know, I found I would I have historically always found that that stuff really hard. I apologise that I'm admitting this, but I have to for the sake of the anecdote. I was on Amazon buying something. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, it wasn't a book. It wasn't a book. It was a very rare food product that you can only buy on Amazon UK. That's the only reason why I was on that dreadful website. Um, <laughs> but I was looking back, you know, when it's like who you send it to and then the options come up. Of, and, and it's mostly like all the different apartments that I've lived in in London. Since and I you moved. have to make sure you don't accidentally send something to an apartment you lived in three yeah, apartments exactly. ago. But then there was this crazy thing where I was like, God, there are a lot of addresses here. Why are there so many addresses? And I went through the addresses and it was like 11 boys were on those addresses from like the last 15 years who I'd sent little poetry books to or who I'd like you know, seen something, an album I'd sent them. And that was what was so weird is I was looking at these names and these addresses that were once so familiar and remembering those roads and those bedrooms from like 2011 or whatever. And I was like, I don't even know who lives in that house anymore. I don't even know what that room looks like. I don't know where that man lives. It, it was like seeing all the, like a, a line of ghosts that in front of me and I just it did do something to me. And that, and that, again, it's like a weird existential grief thing of this person was so involved in my life. They were so flesh and blood. And now I don't even know what their postcode is. I wouldn't even know where to send them. I don't know who they're living with. But, you know, that's the stuff that I think I have always found really hard to get my head around. Yeah, the world just keeps turning. You just yeah. have to keep going no matter what. And it's hard because I think there are people who are much better at it than others. I have friends mm -hmm. that have gone through like crazy breakups, you know, huge things. And they're like, well, and I'm like, well, it's so wild to me. But that's I just find it really difficult in rom-coms how quickly everyone moves on from their relationships. <laughs> you know, in rom-coms where it's like, do you remember with Runaway Bride? Sure. Where like the day before the wedding, she's like, I'm so sorry. I know we've been planning this wedding for ages and we're madly in love and live together. I would actually prefer to marry this weird reporter who I met a week ago. And everyone's a bit like, okay. Sure. Well, like, the love. In Sleepless in Seattle, when everyone is like upset that this man is is still grieving his wife. Oh my God, yeah. And no <laughs> one will leave him alone. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's the one place where I feel like rom-coms have like let me down rather than enriched me mm. in life. I'm like, how come no one ever goes nuts after a breakup in the way that I always have done? Maybe because it's kind of boring to watch. But, you know, I just find it like a really interesting altered mental state when someone's in the first months after a breakup. You know, when you've got a best friend who rings you and it's just like, it's done. He's moved out. Come over. Like, I feel like I never see my friend more like wildly animalistically alive than in those first nights of like, she's crying and then suddenly she's saying all the things that she can't live without him. And then the next breath, she's like, maybe I'm going to start my whole life again. And who's my next love going to be? It's just like, it's such a crazy altered state, I think. I always just have to look at my friends and be like, just don't get bangs. Don't change your hair. <laughs> You can't do it. This isn't the time. I literally had to have that conversation with a friend going through a breakup recently. I was like, please don't, please don't touch the house. Like, just give it six more months. Right. Yeah. You've got to sleep on that more because you won't be happy about it. It's never good. And then everyone else knows it's a whole thing. Yeah. I actually kind of fell foul of it. I had a breakup right before Christmas last year. 
four days before Christmas, which was not great. The breakup, um, it was when I was right. It was halfway through good material. <laughs> so Perfect. it was actually... The gods were looking down on me. The gods of creativity <laughs> were giving me a gift. But I remember, like, the exact moment, like, in the months after that I had that breakup was the exact moment that my algorithm on Instagram decided to harass me with videos of Gen Z beauty bloggers with those, with those like, long noughties bobs, like, north sure. 90s noughties bobs, like, heavily layered. And they're using all the Velcro rollers and whatever. And I just was like, right, well, this is obviously my path. <laughs> it's some of the things are lining up really well. Had a breakup and now I'm being served this haircut constantly. I think I think we know what to do. And my friend Caroline be- like absolutely begged me not to. She was like, I just think that long bob is going to look very different on a 35-year-old woman to a Gen Z beauty blogger. I would just really sit on it. And do you know what? Thank God I did. There's a lot of upkeep involved there that they don't show. Yeah, they the- don't show. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I'm always like, I'd have to style my hair every day. No, I can't. Yeah, no one's doing that. That's exactly it. No one's doing that. I think the next time I go through a breakup, I really need Andy's mom to be there for me because she seems to be the only one who's really getting it in a lot of ways. And she's yeah. like, here you go. Here's the things you'll need. Do you know what? It's um, I'm always so interested with um, writers and filmmakers, like what the stock characters are that just that return and return over and over again because I think if you can't help but always write a character it's set even in a totally fictional way it says something of how you were raised or what was most important to you in life like for example something I noticed with Richard Curtis's films is there is always an adorable sister there is always a younger sister or a younger woman best friend who is you know, fragile, but eccentric and naive, but beautiful in the way that she sees the world, whether that's like Scarlet in Four Weddings or Honey in Notting Hill. And then when I read more about Richard Curtis's life, that reflected the home he grew up in. And and he had these sisters that he completely adored. And I think like the, the one piece of biography that will be in every show that I write and every novel that I write is a loving mum, is a is a mum who always knows what to say. And a woman who's kind of emotionally intelligent and wise as well as good humoured is the one thing that I can't imagine anything else. And I just feel like it's kind of my tribute to her. And I love I mean all of your like side characters in this novel are incredible. But Andy's mom is really one of those things where it's like, oh, I think that's how you know he's going to be okay through all of yeah. it is, is like through connection to her. And as again, I was saying before, and it, you know, all of us here in the office, we're big Morris fans. He <laughs> is one of the best characters, really any of the friends, Kelly, the incredible personal trainer. It's easy to sort of connect with a, a main character a protagonist. You're right in their head, but yet we all know what it's like to have these like strange, really intense figures in our lives who fit just mm-hmm. like in one sliver of our being and we're like all right and often they just are there for a period of time but we're like remember when and everyone has those like side characters from their friends lives that they know like remember when you knew that person at your job and it just becomes a running joke forever yeah and those people are an important square in the patchwork (laughs) quilt of your everyday life whether that is a personal trainer or the man that you lodge with. I love writing kooks. I do just love it. I like writing those periphery kooks. I like eccentrics. The idea for Morris, who's Andy's landlord, who he lives with, who's in his late 70s, it all came from a conversation I had with my friend Tim at dinner years ago, where he was talking about he volunteers with elderly people. And he was talking about someone who he was you know, visiting and was buying food for and just checking in on about how he had this absolute obsess. He was a conspiracist and he had this obsession with Julian Assange and was kept writing these letters, these passionate letters to Julian Assange. Whenever I hear little stories like that, I'm like, I've got to file that away for a periphery kook. I just, I just love it. I just, I just live for those sorts of people. They just make life so much more interesting. And there are always those details where I read and I think like that has to be something real because it's too niche to have made up. Sometimes these things I'm like, that has to be actually from a real life person because 
it's too specific to have been made up. Yeah. Well, do you know what I've really learned from writing fiction and writing scripts is that nothing comes from nothing. Nothing can be created in a vacuum. Years and years ago, I remember watching a documentary about the Harry Potter books and discovering that J.K. Rowling had created so much of the mythology of Hogwarts and the magical land from like the church, from stuff that she had absorbed from being in church. And Margaret Atwood famously with The Handmaid's Tale, there was nothing in that world about the treatment of women that hadn't been directly taken from biblical references or things that had happened in history. You know, I remember hearing that the, the whole idea for The Horse Whisperer came because the author had been at a dinner in the countryside in England and had heard at this dinner someone who owned a farm saying that there was a man on this farm that apparently could communicate with horses. And then that became the whole thing. So actually, like, I think I had this real idea that fiction and, yeah, scripts were just about, like, it germinated from nothing. and Like, it just, but, but it doesn't. Everything comes from something. Yeah, there's so many of those connections. And I think that as readers, too, going through, we all assign our own sort of meanings to things as well. Like, there's characters that, yeah, I mean, I don't know these people. They might come from the author's life, but they always ring a bell of somebody or a situation is like, oh, I can... I can really relate to that because I had this and those like where those two things meet, where the author's like influences and what the reader brings me is like the best place in literature when they all just come together. And I think that that is going to happen with so many people in good material because the situations, though they can be like really heightened, that's what love and life and loss is like so often. Totally. You know, there are moments in it that are, that are really heightened, but. Heartbreak is a heightened emotional state. It's it's an intense emotional state. And I suppose what you're doing with characters on the page or on TV is you're just actualizing what the rest of us are going through internally, I suppose. Like all of us have imagined what it would be to ring your ex on a withheld number sort of a hundred times until you hear their voice. And I suppose like fiction is a place where you can dare to be the person who would do that or, or or understand the person who would do that but i hope that those like more heightened moments of the of the book and andy's heartbreak i hope that the feelings and the and the objectives of how he gets there that that's something relatable to anyone who's gone totally insane from heartbreak and i think we become strangers to ourselves in heartbreak and yet there are so many moments I was reading where I was like, Andy, don't do this, please. <laughs> I know it's going to be bad. You know it's going to be bad. Why? And yeah. and I think we've all had that conversation with friends, but we've all had that yeah. conversation with ourselves, too, of like, you, when you know you shouldn't do it, but you've, you've already done it, you've made up your mind, you've, you know, you're yeah. looking at someone's Instagram through the browser because you've blocked the, them, not, you know? the number of times. <laughs> My friends have had conversations with me or I've had conversations with them where like the week before we've had a dinner where it was like the Senate has been assembled and we have all collectively decided like we're going to block him. Like all of us are going to block our friend's ex. Like, yeah, we don't want to know what he's doing, whatever. And then a week later, a friend will ring me in tears being like, can you believe he was at blah, blah with her? And I'll be like, well, what, how do you know that? And she's like, well, I obviously I've blocked him. <laughs> It's like the most horrible confession that you have to make. Right. Uh-huh. It's it's a lot. There's a lot of the politics that goes into, I think, especially, again, for women, that idea of, like, communally ostracizing someone's ex or, you know, the first text being, my first text is usually, do you need me to beat him up? Like, it, you know, it's going to be okay. <laughs> we love the communal ostrac ostracization. It's, <laughs> it's our superpower. And I love that I'm like now officially entering early middle age and me and my friends deploy it still in every breakup. You it's have to. petty and we just love doing it. Do you know what I think? <laughs> it's like in the depths of despair, it's just this like one little golden nugget that you can have. It's just knowing this man that's treated you horribly has realised that like all his ex's friends hate him. <laughs> I know. 
And that joy you get of, you know, he's sitting knowing that y'all are talking about him. Yeah. And it's, it's, yeah. he knows. Yeah. It's, it's such a like, there are so few little treats that you get from being a heartbroken person. And I think like that's like such a petty little treat that I will enjoy forever. Mm-hmm. The worst is when your friend says, please don't be mean to him, you know, it, and you're like, okay, fine. Unfortunately, I've never had a friend say that. We're oh. all as petty as each other. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me think, too, of in a in sort of a different way about, I think it, there's a line you talk about in Everything I Know About Love about how women have to slot into men's lives more easily mm-hmm. than the other way around. And I think that's part of why Andy struggles so much is that, you know, he didn't realize, and as men often don't, how much Jen entered into his life and fit in all those gaps and empty spaces and made it fuller and made it brighter and supported him in all these ways. And he cannot understand why. He can't see that connection between why he now feels so horrible. Yeah, and the other thing that I do really like I really, really feel for men when they have a breakup. And not only do I see this with like my male friends and my ex-boyfriends, but I see it with like men my parents' age, if they like get divorced or if they like tragically lose their wife, is like, I think for so many men, I think this is changing, but I think traditionally and historically for so many men, their entire access to their emotional inner life is their female partner, that she is the key to all of it. Bad day at work, that's the person they talk to. Grief about a family member, that's the person they speak to. Like so many women I know are kind of the only receptacle for their male partner's entire emotional conversation with themselves and and like deepest feelings. So when that's taken away, you know, I think what Andy struggles with is there is only one person that he would come home to, like when he's feeling this bad and lost, that he would come home to or go to the pub with and really, really expose the minutiae of everything he's feeling. And that's the one person that he can't call. And women don't, on the whole, have that. There's always someone we can call. It is certainly a different perspective reading through because trying to put myself in Andy's position, like you said, I'd be like, well, I could handle it this way, but he just doesn't have both Mm. the like external and internal resources to sort of know that. And I think he, you know, there is progress made through, he definitely has an arc. He learns as he goes through, because I think if if he didn't, this would be a pretty tough read to just like watch him slam his head up against the wall. Yeah. But, you know, it is one of those ideas that sometimes the heartbreak is the learning thing you need. Totally. And the thing that I'm so interested in with heartbreak is it's next to death in terms of you dying or someone you love dying. It is the worst pain a human can feel. And yet we all go through it. Every single one of us goes through it. But it is so painful. Wanting to be with someone who doesn't want to be with you is it feels like a violation of a human right. It's just not being able to love the person you love in a, in a present way. It just feels like barbaric. It's so painful. And yet, one of the greatest human rights is that no one has to be with someone they don't want to be with. You get one life and no one is obliged to be in a relationship they don't want to be in. So how do we allow those two truths to exist? It's really hard. And yet, we all keep doing it. (laughs) And we all keep pushing forward and talking to our friends about it. (laughs) Keep downloading those bloody apps. Come on, let's have another go. (laughs) I know, it's so, it is the biggest thing. Because it's like, you know, what does anyone want? Anyone wants that connection. It's the risk is so great, but the reward is pretty amazing too. So I think we all just keep, keep going and keep talking to our friends and calling them in the middle of the night. Yeah, you got to keep going. The thing that I have come to realize about breakups, which I do now, I like equate to grief, is, you know, it's it's a cliche for the re for a reason about grief being the price we pay for love. Like the depth of grief that you feel in the wake of a broken relationship is only ever a reflection of the, you know, the cavernous depth of love that you felt. 
And it's an honor to have loved someone that much. And it's kind of easy to withdraw from it completely. And I have at times in my life thought, no, I just, the risk is too high and the rewards are not great enough for me right now, potentially for what the, what the risk is. But I think every time that you have a breakup or you have a broken heart and you're grieving someone, it's a sign that you're participating in life. It's a sign that you're a part of something. It's a sign that you're unafraid to connect. And that's something that we should all be proud of. And I think so often that's why we come to literature and we come to, I think, especially fiction, because we can have those sort of feelings reflected at us in a a way that's really accessible. And, you know, I know I have often read books and felt like, oh, I never realized that that's why I felt like that. But Mm -hmm. through that character's, you know, sort of experience or through an author's, you know, way of wording something, you can have a lot of that stuff reflected back at you. And it doesn't feel like reading necessarily like self-help or something that's really like punching you in the face with it. It's more like, yeah, all right, this is a human experience and we're all sitting with it. Totally. I remember the first time that I was broken up with, I was living at home with my mum and dad. And one of the most powerful pieces of advice I had in that time, it wasn't even a piece of advice, it was just some some words, some comforting words, was um, the day my dad came home from work, that after it had happened, I hadn't seen him. My dad, who at this point would have been like in his 60s, who's like quite conservative fellow, like very um, alpha male and not hugely emotional. And he just came and see me and he gave me a huge hug and he just said, we've all been there. And it was like, I had not even entertained the possibility that this is a feeling that my dad had ever had in his life. And it was like suddenly blew open the world for me in this way. You know, I was, you know, probably quite an adolescent way of looking at the world that every feeling I have, probably I was the first to have it. But, you know, I was just like, no one is immune from this. This is a part of the package deal of being on earth and being part of a human and being involved with others and in, in, entangled up in each other's lives. None of us get out of this without this feeling, at least once. And in this book, I think things, something that's really interesting is the timeline you sort of put us on. We're very like ascribed to dates. And I think that when you're in that headspace, time feels like both huge and very small. Like every day is both the longest and shortest day as you move forward. But definitely some things are skipped over. Like you can't obviously have everything in. And I always wonder, are there like scenes that are on the cutting room floor somewhere that you wish you could have added in? (laughs) Yes. So first of all, I love that you've noticed that about dates because that was something that I think initially they were like, this is kind of weird. Like it's diary entries, but it's not diary entries. And why is it these specific, like the days and the dates and the numbers and the month? Because I was like, all you're doing is living. When Whenever I've had a breakup, particularly when I've been broken up with, you're doing these weird childish maths games of like, right, well, it's been this amount of time since I heard from them, which means probably if I double that, then they're that, at that moment, they'll call me or it's this amount of time until their birthday. And when it's their birthday, I'll get to finally send them a text in a legitimate way. And then I might re- rekindle something or this time a year ago, this is where we were, or it's now been half the time. Or You know, you, you do do this like magical thinking, I think, to try and get some sort of sense or, or control over this completely uncontrollable situation. So that's why I'm glad that you noticed that. And in terms of the cutting room floor, yes. So my toxic trait as a writer (laughs) is I overwrite. I overwrite everything. And my column is like, has to be about 850. Well, they let me go up to about 890 now, but it's pushing it a bit. But every week I write a thousand words and I have to cut them out. This book, I handed in 120,000 words. We had to get it down to 90. I always overwrite every script for everything I know about love the TV series. I was meant to hand in maximum 45. I'd hand in 80. I just, I just can't, I just can't be concise. (laughs) So there's loads that we had to cut. The one thing that I'm really sad that we had to cut is there was um, a, a whole chapter where Andy went up to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, which is like the biggest comedy festival in the UK and maybe even one of the biggest in the world. He goes there 
not as a performer because he doesn't take shows to the fringe anymore because he just wasn't making enough money from it. So he goes there as a punter. He goes there as just a, just a person. And he has to watch all his peer group do all their shows. And everyone's asking him about like his show. And he's just there. Sort of like the guy going back to the office who doesn't work at that office anymore. And there was like, it was such a specific thing. And I had a long conversation with a comedian about what that specific summer at the Edinburgh Fringe feels like. And he was said, we talked about how strange it is. So I really like that section. And, I, and I've spent three summers as a, unfortunately, performer in inverted commas in musicals in my late teens and early 20s. So I've always wanted to write about what those summers at the Fringe are like. But something got to go. So we had to get rid I feel like there's just like this alternate universe out there of all these like little scenes and vignettes of these characters, which I always like to imagine because I like to think of, you know, all the things in between when I'm reading. I'm like, you know, I know that these characters are out there doing other things. And but at the same time, I think all the pieces that are that did make it in are like the exact right number of things and the exact right moments of things that go through because. Yeah. Yeah. It really feels accurate to that time, to that time in your life when you're like, oh, this is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. And every day is so long. And yet all of a sudden you look and you're like, how has it already been three months or six months? Or Exactly. Thank you for saying that. I mean, the thing that I really learned from making TV show, and I really didn't want to learn this, but unfortunately I did, is it, it's just always good to cut. It's just like... The more uncomfortable you feel about cutting, the better. It's just, you it, it's, you always have to cut more than you think. And I have a folder on my laptop that goes back through memoir from columns that were lost, from film scripts that never went anywhere, cut scenes in books and in scripts called off cuts. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just all of it's in there. It's just this like weird freezer full of like half eaten food that I think one day I'll return to and sometimes I do in 15 20 years you put that out as like the you know the Dolly Alderton (laughs) b-sides as you like hear everything that I (laughs) cut from somewhere else wade through it make of it what you will (laughs) what a weird book that would be (laughs) I think people would love it thank you (laughs) I have to say too you're talking a little bit about you know adapting everything I know about love for tv yeah. And there is a great audiobook of good material with Arthur Darville and Vanessa Kirby reading. But I wonder, did you have like celebrities in mind when you were writing? Do you like put faces to your characters or you're like, I can't do that. That messes me up. It messes me up a bit. So <laughs> I don't I don't do that. Because also the thing that's like casting is such a fun part of the process. And when I've had meetings with production companies about the potential adaptation of good material, They've thrown names at me for Andy that I'm like, what the heck? I would never have seen that guy as Andy. And then it makes you think and then you suddenly see, you know, that's the joy of writing something and then putting it out in the world is that it just takes on this whole new life and you can see it through all these other different perspectives. And so I like the brainstorm of other people thinking about, about which actors they imagine attached to it. I mean, in terms of, so Vanessa Kirby is a friend of mine. When I was thinking about the audiobook for Jen, and who I wanted. Obviously, it doesn't matter what a character looks like. They've just kind of mm-hmm. the right voice in audio. But I was thinking about who I saw for Jen, and I was like, oh, my God, I have totally written a part for Vanessa Kirby. I hadn't even realised. I was like, everything, like the voice is right. She looks exactly like Jen. And maybe that was in the back of my head when I was writing it. Or I don't know. I mean, I'm much more likely when I'm writing um, characters to their face is to be an amalgamation of people I've met. So I wonder if Jen, there was Vanessa's face somewhere there in the back of my head, but she's done a beautiful job. It is a great audio book. I mean, I was reading and listening because I like to get the full experience and it is wow. a top tier, a top tier experience. Thank you. I know it's not going to be a, the off cut B sides, but is there mm-hmm. anything that you're working on next? That's you're very excited about. Yeah, I'm taking, I'm not writing a book this year. So um, I'm taking it as a TV and film year. So I've just got a load of scripts that I'm working on at the moment at various different stages. And I'm doing a big American trip uh, next month and for all of March to do the launch of Good Material there, which I'm so excited about. 
I'm going to LA for the first time in my life. So I've obviously just been listening to like ladies of the canyon over and over again and imagining sure. all I'm seeing myself is Laurel Canyon in the 1970s. Like I'm not engaging at all with what the rest of LA is like. It's mm-hmm. just going to be floating around barefoot in um, a caftan doing Joni Mitchell cosplay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think that'll go really well. And you just you just put blinders onto everything else. You're like, this is the experience I'm having for myself. That's totally. Although I was reading up about Laurel Canyon today and I read this thing that I just wish I could remove from my brain because I know it's gonna like ruin my whole trip where it was like trivia about Laurel Laurel Canyon. It's like Father John Missy, you know, that incredible Mm -hmm. story I adore and who's also very beautiful. Father John Missy wrote the song, I can't remember what the song, oh, something about meeting you at the store based on the fact that he met his wife in the parking lot of the Laurel Canyon country store. So I have obviously this afternoon, when I've had so much work to do, instead of doing the work, I've just been like on Google image, looking at pictures of the shop in Laurel Canyon, Mm -hmm. imagining all the folk musicians who I'm going to meet and fall in love with in the Mm -hmm. aisles while buying my cereal. I mean, what else could you possibly spend time doing? That seems really important to me. I don't know, but... (laughs) <laughs> Sometimes you have to just, If the harder you try to push it out, the more you'll think about it. So you just have to. I invent. know. You're so right. It was when I was on the Google reviews of the shop that I was like, yeah. I am wasting uh-oh, time uh-oh. now. <laughs> yeah. You're like zooming in on other people's pictures they've posted. You're like, I got to get out of here. <laughs> well, I am so excited for the American re- launch of Good Material. It's going to be so amazing. So- People are going to love it. I can already tell. And they should pick up your backlist. Everything I know about love, ghosts, dear Dolly. There's so many good things for people to learn about you and your writing before they get a chance to pick up good material. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. I've completely loved this conversation. And I'm also so grateful to um, Barnes & Noble for the support and the celebration that they have um, very generously showed the book and me. So thank you so much. Of course. Thank you so much. Hello, readers. It's time for another TBR Top Off. We're going to recommend a couple of fantastic books to pick up when you stop in for your copy of Good Material. I'm Mark at my Barnes & Noble in Cincinnati, and I'm joined by my book buddy, Mary. Hi, Mary. Hi. I'm at uh, Barnes & Noble in Belmont, Texas. So I'm going to go ahead and jump right in. I am very excited about Good Material. I think that's going to be a huge blast. Dolly Alderton is just fun. And I can't wait to have fun with her with this book. I was thinking about that sort of rise of the, I guess, elevated rom-com or literary rom-com. And it brought me back to a book I read uh, about a year ago. It's a fantastic debut novel about messiness and honesty in relationships. And that is Cleopatra and Frankenstein by Coco Mellers. Oh boy, this book. It follows Cleo, a 20-something British artist who is now in New York and uh, almost flailing, we'll say flailing adjacent. And she meets Frank, who is a 40-something self-made man whose success on the page, uh, I think, is masking a lot of his shortcomings, emotionally in particular. They are meet up, not quite a meet cute, but we'll say a meet cute-ish results in an impulsive marriage of convenience and lack of forethought that spins their lives in directions that nobody can anticipate. I love the dark humor and candor in this novel. It feels very honest. It feels like reading something while sitting next to your friend at a bar. And I also really appreciate the cast of supporting characters in this book. I think each one feels so fleshed out and has their own very interesting story that they could have their own novel in their own right. So all of these people are uncomfortably familiar and delicately flawed and absolutely entertaining. Bonus for this book, this is Barnes & Noble's February pick for fiction. It's one of our favorites. We are very excited to showcase. So pop into your local Barnes & Noble and you'll see it displayed and championed. And that is Cleopatra and Frankenstein by Coco Mellers. Mary, what do you have for us? Okay, so I have Josh and Hazel's Guide to Not Dating by Christina Lauren. So I was drawn to the comedic, the chaos, and the messy that is love and dating and relationship as well. 
So Josh and Hazel um, meet in college and they have a very awkward, weird encounter and a very awkward, weird email follows. They go their separate ways and the book picks up and 10 years later, they are setting each other up on blind dates because they're just friends. Mm. And these blind dates are doubly awkward because they are double dates with each other. And they just get progressively more funny for the reader, but not, let's say, for the participant. Josh and Hazel keep waking up next to each other and hanging out after the dates, but they're just friends. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've all had during the month of February just friends and weird, awkward dates. So I figured it would be thematic and go well with everything that we're recommending this month. Um, So my recommend for TBR Top Off is. Josh and Hazel's Guide to Not Dating by Christina Lauren. Fantastic. We could all use a little bit of messiness that we can um, participate in without actually participating in, because I'm sure we've all had our share. So, yeah, nice picks all around. Uh, But that is all we have for today. Thanks so much for tuning into Poured Over. Please make sure to give us a rating and subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can also follow us on our socials at Barnes & Noble. Pretty simple. I'm Mark. You can follow my home store at BN Westchester. Mary, where can we find you? I'm Mary. You can follow me at BNTBN. All right. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Happy reading. Goodbye. Thank you for listening. Poured Over is a Barnes & Noble production. To help other readers find us, please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts.